And once more, a very warm welcome to the launch event for our merits paper on China at this web seminar on the CCP's next century, expanding economic control, digital governance and national security. My name is Mikko Tari, I'm the executive director of merits and I would like to warmly welcome you to what is going to be a dense afternoon, 90 minutes of um, expertise and good debates on the future of the CCP. Obviously, the context of this session is that China will celebrate its 100th anniversary with the Communist Party of China in July. Um, at the same time, everyone is very well aware of the global context of uh, that celebration. And we just had um, the G7 meeting, a NATO meeting, and another meeting of transatlantic EU US um, coordination, including on China policy happening this week. So it's an intense um, period of time thinking about the future of China and the future of our China relationship. And um, I very much look forward to wonderful panelists, great discussion of a rich and dense paper that we um, shared with you before this um, meeting today. Um, I wish you all a good afternoon and would like to hand over now to my dear colleague, Claudia Bessling as your host today and look forward to the discussion later. Thank you, Miko, and a very warm welcome also from my side. Um, I am Claudia Wessling, Director of Communications and Publications at Merix, and I will guide you through today's session. Um, before I introduce our speakers and panelists, um, let me um, briefly um, point out that this event is being recorded. The recording will be available on the Merix website after the event, and if you have questions regarding our personal data policies, um, please visit our data protection page on our website. Um, so just uh, take note of this, please. Um, but now to uh, the session we have in store for you. 90 minutes, um, a lot of information on the CCP's next century. And we have three uh, topical areas we would like to cover with you. Um, economy, digital governments, and national security. Um, before we dive into the sessions, let me briefly introduce you to our external guests. Um, I'm particularly pleased to uh, welcome Meg Rithmeyer, Associate Professor at Harvard Business School. Meg got up early today. She's in the States. Um, thanks for that, Meg. Really appreciate it. We have Rochier Kremers here. He's an Assistant Professor at Leiden University and Wolfgang Niedermark, member of the executive board at BDI, a German federation, <laughs> business federation. Um, our Merix analysts um, on the panel are Katja Drienhausen. Um, she's a coordinator of our team on politics and society. Um, we have Nis Grünberg here, um, the lead author of the study we're actually presenting here today. Um, he co-leads um, the politics and society team together with Katja. And last but not least, Helena Legarda, um, coordinator of our international relations program. Um, so the study, uh, the, our session here will be structured into, into three parts, as I said. Um, Nis will talk about um, how the CCP wants to align economy and politics. Then we have Katja, um, with her input on um, digitalization and how the Communist Party uses this for uh, improving governance on the one hand, but also uh, strengthening control over society on the other hand. Um, and uh, in the last part, um, Helena will introduce us to um, China's or the CCP's new paradigm of security first that also um, has its impacts uh, abroad, as we will see. And to wrap up the whole session here, we will um, bring together our guest commentators again at the end, um, together with Miko, to discuss what all this means for stakeholders and policymakers in Europe and the world. So, but now, without further ado, I would just pass it on to Nis Grünberg for his first input. Um, short input, then we will have a short input by um, Mac Rithmeyer, and then we'll have a short Q&A on this one. Um, for you in the audience, um, you can use the chat function in Zoom to pose your questions to the panelists um, all along, and I will try to pick questions from this chat and discuss with the panelists here. Um, all right, and Nis, I would pass it on to you. The stage is yours. 
Thank you. <clears throat> uh, could you move to the next slide, please? So let me just give you a quick flyby of some of the main uh, arguments and same main points of uh, the chapter uh, that deals with uh, party state capitalism under Xi, uh, and as uh, Claudia said, uh, th this drive to align economics under politics. So it, it kind of picks up the debate that is going on right now um, on the, the, the type of order that the Chinese political economy is. Um, and that, that argues that China has left behind uh, the kind of ordinary garden variety of state capitalism and really has evolved into becoming more or less its own type of economic order called party state capitalism. And the, the, the party leadership uh, quite uh, simply believes that this is the best system for China to go forward with. It feels that it is a stable and resilient system uh, and this has been verified by some of the recent events, among others, the, the, the handling of the COVID crisis. Um, and, and also, of course, in, in contrast to the external world, how that was dealt with abroad, it sees that this uh, system in a systemic competition, which Beijing increasingly is, uh, is, is seeing itself in with uh, Western counterparts, uh, that this party state capitalism is advantageous to Western systems. Um, the, the main features of this system uh, that now has, as I said, left behind this ordinary state capitalism and becomes more or less its own uh, variety uh, is that it retains a very strong uh, public economy or very um, uh, strong part of the economy is, in, in, is controlled by um, public entities such as state-owned enterprises, but also a monopoly over the financial sector by state-owned banks. Um, and, and this is really a, a pretty constant in the, the history uh, over the last couple of years, and this is maintained also. Um, at the same time, the, the public actors or the, the investments of the public sphere into the economy is deepening and is also um, becoming more complex. So the, the constellations of ownerships, uh, of, of types of controls, of partnerships between public and private sectors uh, are really becoming more complex um, and much more complex in the ordinary uh, or in, in, than it was before. Um, this is shareholding, but this is, this is also PPPs, different types. This is uh, all kinds of different uh, new uh, forms of partnerships. Um, what, another very prominent feature is uh, really the attempt to uh, institutionalize the mechanisms uh, by which the party state leadership can steer markets and can encroach on markets and guide resources or, or raise and guide resources towards political objectives, um, for, for example, through industrial policy. And one of the, the, the main mechanisms that are uh, developed to do this uh, in a more institutionalized uh, manner that identify uh, in, in the paper is, for example, state guidance funds that are uh, mobilizing resources towards specific sectors and industries. Finally, very important also, especially under Xi Jinping, is that uh, the, the push to have ideology uh, and party norms as an uh, to, to imbue them with, with uh, normative power also uh, in the economic uh, activity in the economic sector, that is really growing. So an, a more politicized business environment, but also uh, really the, the institutionalization and the codification of party norms in corporate charters uh, and in, in, in different, uh, through different mechanisms. Uh, ideology is becoming more important under anything, and that is also really felt in the economy. So some of the main implications, uh, I think, uh, that are uh, mapped out in the chapter is that economic activity in general should really, or it is um, in, in this ideal type uh, thinking that is behind, thought us uh, of as just ordinary uh, political activity. So as an economic actor, regardless of you being a certain enterprise or a local government or a private entrepreneur, you should uh, move away from this or um, fr from this perception of you as a capitalist that is just red seeing uh, to become a corporate citizen. Um, and by this citizenship, you have rights to uh, earn money, but you have also some duties. Uh, so the, the drive to create an environment where patriotic entrepreneurship and uh, more ideology driven corporate uh, charters uh, are, are the norm, um, companies should aid the national project. Uh, it is also important, I think, to. Um, to remember that this is not only about power politics, uh, it is really a trade-off that is, is, is tried to, to be, uh, to, to be uh, built here between control and performance. So it's not only about controlling everything, it's also about steering 
uh, performance into the right uh, or the, the the identified priority sectors. Um, so this, uh, I, I think, it, we need to understand this as a kind of society-wide model that is trying to be uh, built around party leadership, and that is both giving uh, the the political leadership control, but it's also uh, maintaining a long-term stability in the economic uh, uh, growth uh, model that is being uh, presented here. Then convergence, finally, this is the implication, uh, of course, that is uh, a bit more sobering maybe for, for many, convergence and the level playing field that, I, that is hoped for uh, by lots of companies that try to uh, compete in the Chinese markets or with Chinese competitors on equal terms are um, very much uh, unlikely more than ever before, I would say, because the party believes that this is uh, the right way forward to go. And, and institutionalization of these mechanisms uh, is driven very strongly forward under Xi Jinping. Um, so these were, these are, this is a very quick flyby, of course, of the, um, of the content of the chapter and feel free to read more details and I'm looking forward to uh, your comments, uh, Mac. Well, first, um, let me just say it's a pleasure to be here um, with Merrick. As I told my co-panelists when we joined the call, it's been years that I've learned from the work that, um, that you all have done. And so it's a pleasure to read this very rich paper and to be able to comment on it. And so, um, as Nis said, you know, this is a flyby summary. Those of you who are interested in these particular features, the paper really is quite rich and in going into some detail about how exactly China's political economy has changed in the last 10 years or so, um, especially under Xi Jinping. Um, I agree with almost all of the insights that the paper produces, um, especially this new model of politics being in command for a long period of time. Um, when we thought about the role of the state in the Chinese economy, it was about kind of introducing market mechanisms to solve the problems associated with excessive state involvement in the economy. And now we seem to be in a different mode where it's about introducing the party state itself as a solution to the problems generated by markets. And the paper goes through a number of ways in which that's happening, including, as you just heard, state shareholding, excessive corporate governance intervention and Chinese firms, um, a variety of new uh, demands for political fealty from entrepreneurs within China, as well as, of course, from multinational corporations who are seeking access to the Chinese market. And so the ultimate picture we get um, of China's new political economy is that it is political objectives that supersede economic ones rather than economic growth being the bottom line of the party state's intervention within the economy. Let me just say a few things um, about what's in the paper and about some of the implications that um, Nies wasn't able to, to cover, but that might be helpful for setting a sort of discussion about what the implications of this new model are. So first, uh, there's a lot in the paper about this idea, which we hear a lot from Beijing these days, that China's model is ascendant, that China's model is proven superior to Western liberal democracy or liberal capitalism driven by markets, um, and that that's showcased, for example, in the management of COVID-19. And I just want to emphasize what's also in the paper, which is that in many ways, the resurgence of the state in the economy in China, this new political control does in fact come from a feeling of fragility rather than necessarily just triumphalism, that the triumphalism kind of came later. And especially in the last year, as we've seen, or at least China's narrative is that the West has failed with the pandemic or has failed with politics in a variety of ways, especially the United States, whereas China is much more stable. And so I think there's a danger in, in some ways in believing their own propaganda, both us all, all believing it as well is them, them, the CCP itself believing its own propaganda that its system is better. Because one of the hallmarks, one of the reasons why the regime has been um, so adaptive and so effective over time, managing a lot of different problems, is it's constantly on its toes. It's a paranoid regime, it always has been. And so this deepening sense of triumphalism, I think we forget that just a few years ago, it was a deep sense of insecurity, insecurity in global markets, insecurity in domestic um, economic and financial stability that drove this new role for the state. Um, and so that balance between fragility on the one hand and triumphalism on the other plays out in propaganda, but we should also be very mindful of the ways in which the CCP perceives itself to be threatened internally and externally. The second point um, to emphasize is that even though there is this increased role for the party state in all sorts of guises, which the paper talks about so richly, 
I think that it's worth mentioning that the CCP itself really thinks that the role for markets is still maintained. So for example, if you look at the industrial policy and the government guidance funds, they're novel in the sense that they're allocating capital to the quote unquote private sector, right? To firms that are not actually owned by, or majority owned by the state. And that's a new mode of industrial policy in China. That's not something we've seen to this extent um, in, in Chinese political economic history. And the idea is that you let private or non-state managers of capital allocate that fund and you introduce these market mechanisms. And so it really isn't that the, the party state itself has completely abandoned markets. Um, it's just trying to reassert politics alongside markets. My view is that that's an uneasy equilibrium to maintain, that once you introduce things like private managers of capital or you, 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 you suffuse state capital throughout the economy, you get a series of problems, including misallocation of capital. We've seen a lot of fraud in China. The paper talks about um, some of these things as well. And so we shouldn't necessarily just think that they've abandoned markets, nor should we think that they have control over every one of these new features that they've introduced. In fact, this delicate balance of, of trying to make sure that capital goes to the ends that the party state wants to see it go to, or that, or that the, the different um, groups in China, firms, even government officials are using it the way they want it to. Those problems persist even under what I have called party state capitalism and what the paper calls party state capitalism. And lastly, in terms of implications, um, if Nisa's last convergence one is sobering, I'm afraid I have a much more sobering one, which is that one of the major implications of party state capitalism has been to generate tremendous international backlash um, that comes from the United States, obviously, um, where I sit today, but, but also in Europe. And so we can think about that um, in a number of ways, that one of the main implications of, of this new role for politics and this new role for the party state has been to erode the boundary between the private sector and the state such that internationally and even domestically within China, it's difficult to figure out where the state ends and where private commercial motives begin. And when you're sitting in Washington DC or in Brussels or Berlin, that's a very difficult um, economy with which to interact, right? To know, especially in high tech sectors or sectors of systemic importance, which are not necessarily technological, if I'm dealing with a Chinese firm, am I also dealing with the Chinese state? And so we've seen a variety of investment reviews, new regulatory controls, new diplomatic and transnational efforts to contain Chinese firms because of the fear that in fact the state is in charge. And this kind of backlash has really limited China's potential to expand and their goals in Europe and the United States and elsewhere. And so one thing to take a look at, I think in the future is whether China under Xi Jinping kind of consolidates this model or makes adjustments to it. For example, the national intelligence law and national security laws, these laws that very much make it seem that the state is in total command and can commandeer the assets of any particular firm in China are generating so much backlash that they're, that they're containing China's own um, ambitions and really limiting the possibilities for Chinese firms. And so what that blowback um, might mean for the adjustment of China's model is something that I think we'll see unfold in the next five or 10 years. Um, but again, this is uh, just an incredibly rich paper and a, and a wonderful way to think about the Chinese economy. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm privileged to have the opportunity to read and comment on it and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mac, and thank you, Nis. Um, at this point, the invitation goes to the audience to post your questions in the chat. Um, but of course, I have questions ready for you guys. Um, and um, maybe if I may start with Nis, I mean, Meg just gave an assessment of what she thinks might happen um, to all these uh, ambitions of the party state to control the economy. Um, and in your paper, Nis, you are also uh, right that um, China sees its model as the superior one um, to solve in imbalances caused by laissez-faire capitalism and poorly regulated finance, for instance. But uh, in your opinion, what are the chances of the CCP to succeed with this ambitious plan of organically merging economy and politics? Well, well, I, <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard question to answer. I, I think, though, that the party uh, leadership is asking itself the same question and is trying to find out. So we might just wait and see what, how far they can go. Um, but I mean, uh, really, I, I think what we at the very least can, can expect is that 
for a long time, if you look at, at the, the Chinese political economy over, over time, there's always been this kind of pendulum swinging forth and back from, from, uh, from more control and a bit more, uh, less control. And this will, I mean, how far can, can the pendulum be, be uh, kind of pushed to the one side is the question. I think it has to go back at some point because there, it creates its own uh, tensions. Um, but at the very least, I think what really is attempted at the moment is to codify uh, party norms um, to, to kind of hard code and hardwire the entire system so that at least, you know, a party um, agents or party uh, objectives are um, kind of hard coded into the legal system. Uh, and in, in that way, it also becomes invisible uh, to, you know, the individual actor. It becomes just a normal, a kind of normative way, uh, it's of an institution really of how to operate in the market. And um, I think this is, this has always been the ideal type or the, the wish uh, by many leaders before, but I think Xi Jinping uh, and his leadership, they now have uh, a lot more tools at their disposal to really uh, push much, much, much further. Um, I, I think the, another, uh, another aspect of this is this, uh, you know, top level design, which is a Xi Jinping uh, kind of program. He wants to create blueprints at the center that are then used at local uh, by local governments to solve problems in a more uniform way. Um, and, and it really is trying to um, eradicate this problem of, uh, of uh, the emperor's far away, your local, uh, local governments uh, kind of sabotaging or adjusting central policies to, to their own needs. Uh, and I don't think that it will work uh, as easily. And, and the tension will probably at some point really be um, emerging at local levels, province levels and big cities in which the central policy push is really not that applicable. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's clear limitations and we will probably see them uh, unfolding in the next couple of years. Thank you, Ms. Clear limitations to the ambition. Um, I would like to pick up a question from Irene Orr in the chat. Um, she's asking, and you, you, you mentioned it in passing, Ms. What is the impact of territorial fragmentation or competition on the evolution of party state capitalism and question would go to both of you. So who's first, Nis? Mac, Mac, do you want to take a shot? Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Well, I mean, I would echo what Nies just just said in terms of you know one of the one of the most successful elements of the Chinese model has been decentralization over time, right? And so, um, you know, for those of us who've been studying China for you know decades, we this is kind of what we hold dear that it's always been a sort of you know not totally bottom up. I think Sebastian Heilman has called it you know um, tinkering with, under uncertainty and experimentation under hierarchy. So there's always a, a someone in control in Beijing who decides what experiments work and what don't, but this autonomy given right to, to local levels to innovate and solve their own problems and then the ability to scale up some of those solutions has been a hallmark of the party's ability to adapt and to solve problems over time. I mean, one thing we have to realize it is a problem solving regime. It's a regime that wants to solve problems, but this new kind of technology, which is very much you know, focused on the center, politics and command, um, it, it inhibits risk taking in, a, in, in, in even good ways, right, from local levels. Levels. And so, you know, that seems to be a problem. But I mean, I would say in response to territorial fragmentation, I, I see Xi Jinping's drive towards centralization and party state capitalism as their potential solution to the feeling that there has been a loss of control, that there has been a loss of party discipline. Um, I think it goes back to, to Chongqing and Boisi Lai several years ago. And so you can see, you know, a, a history of this. Um, but, you know, the idea that, you know, to see what happened in Xinjiang or in Tibet, um, you know, 10 years ago, that's intolerable to the party state. And so, um, so no territorial fragmentation and differentiation, I think will be tolerated under Xi Jinping. And that, and that could really be a problem for the model and the success it's generated so far. Thank you, Mac. And um, Nis, would you like to add to this? If not, I can just, I can also ask another question. Okay, um, there's actually one question I see here in the chat also, and it's a little broader, but you could also boil it down to the economic sphere. What criteria should be used to evaluate the performance of a governance model? Um, I actually had a similar question prepared myself uh, that was more referred to the state guidance funds. I mean, there's 1,700 uh, about 1,700 of such funds deployed. Um, how do you assess if they are successful or not, is there statistics for that or does anyone, 
I don't know, do math on that? <laughs> I, I think um, that the introduction of state guidance funds is exactly to create a better system to monitor how efficient uh, um, industrial policy is really arriving at the, uh, you know, the companies, uh, you know, is the money that is, is, uh, that is raised and funneled into specific sectors really leading into breakthroughs and technology and patents and all that. Um, so I think they are getting better uh, at this and are creating um, or at, 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 at installing some kind of market mechanisms in the management, for example, uh, market discipline in management. Um, but I, I think the it, it's very difficult. Um, one mechanism that, of course, exists is the cadre evaluation. So um, officials are evaluated. Uh, you know, there's lists of of, of, of more than 100 criteria. Uh, that is, is evaluating them and so it's good for the promotion if they perform well on, on a particular set of, of issues and usually economic growth um, and, and performing well on key priorities including for example uh, you know establishing high-tech zones and creating a, a breakthrough in this technology under your watch that could be a, a, a criteria so I think there's political and career uh, motivations that is, is uh, pushing industrial policy um, but there's not yet uh, a full system in place that really is, I think, suited to assess uh, how much waste uh, and how much success there is in, 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 these, in this allocation of resources. Um, I, I think one thing that needs to be said also is that it not necessarily is a system that is geared to ultimate efficiency, but it is about effectiveness. So uh, it's a hedging mechanism more than it is a market mechanism. Uh, so if you have you might invest in 10 companies, nine of them fail, you lose a lot of money, but one of them is creating a breakthrough technology. That is enough to justify uh, the waste of the other nine. So I think this is something that is very important to, 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 uh, to remember when it comes to industrial policy and the you know, if, lack of efficiency of SOEs. So this is maybe just a risk that is taken into account. Um, I see many big questions here in the audience, and this is good. We will get to this um, in the wrap-up session. But uh, for now, I would like to stick with the more specialized uh, stuff. Um, and Hans Maul is asking uh, what the role of ecological constraints is when it comes to making party state capitalism functional. How well is uh, party state capitalism placed to adapt to new kinds of constraints? And that would be the last question for the session. Then we'll move on. Um, I don't know, Mac, if I'm also, I would like to have, uh, have your opinion on this. I think this is a new, um, just very briefly, this is a new, uh, one of the new really big risks that the leadership is, is seeing at, on the horizon. So I think they take it pretty seriously. But this is exactly where they have not found the, uh, they have not cracked the code on how to how to deal with uh, with even risks that you can see emerging on the horizon, and that require system change or that require really a change of the the the, the mechanisms uh, of of bureaucracy uh, and how you know resources are channel, channeled differently. I I think they take it pretty seriously, but we have not seen uh, the full solution to the system yet. I think there's lots of propaganda, but uh, exactly the same problem, how to roll out, uh, you know, environmental policy at local levels when you also want growth, you also want uh, to invest in infrastructure and so on. I, I think this is something that has not been, um, been solved yet. But Mac, I, I mean, maybe you I'll just add a, a thing there, a little point there. First of all, I just want to say, to, I agree completely with your point about to the party state acting as a venture capitalist. They expect, you know, many of the investments to fail. That's part of um, what they expect. But we shouldn't lose sight that, you know, one of the major arenas that they are channeling these investments are things like electric vehicles and, um, and sort of climate uh, green technology. And I think we're going to see a lot of countries, including my own, which has dealt with industrial policy like a bad word, you know, for 30 years, also making those kinds of investments. And so we'll see similar dynamics everywhere. Um, but, you know, but just the point of the ecological constraints, you know, broadly construed, what China wants and what we see Xi Jinping do with the anti-poverty campaign and declaring an end to poverty in China is this huge rise of a very consuming um, domestic middle class. And there are huge constraints to that. There are population constraints to that. There are ecological constraints to that. And I agree that those are not the challenges that have been managed very effectively so far um, by the party state. But, uh, but I think that the, the, the person who posed, posed the question is right to pay attention to those what I would call structural con constraints on China's growth over time. 
time. Um, huge problems on the horizon and, and no, nothing easy to solve, but thank you. And a lot of work left to be done for you as scientists uh, and researchers who go to China for a few trips uh, every once in a while or look at documents. So I'm looking forward to what you guys are going to find out in the future about this topic. Um, for the time being, thank you both Nis and Meg Rismeyer from Harvard Business School for your insights. Um, and we will continue this right through the re most recent uh, policies of the CCP, turning now to um, digitalization policies and I try to move the slide here. Um, just give me a minute. Yes, here we are. Um, our next uh, speaker will be Katja Drienhausen, who heads the um, politics and society team at Merix, and she wrote the, the article in the Merix paper on China together with another um, much esteemed colleague, John Lee, from our international relations team. John is also in the audience and uh, will be answering your questions if they touch upon his field of expertise. And after Katja's input, uh, we welcome Rochier Kremers for his input. Rochier is at Leiden University, um, works on digitalization and cybersecurity issues. And he's also the, one of the founders of DigiChina, a platform on digitalization issues that is very interesting to read. I can only recommend it. But now I turn it over to Katja. The stage is yours for your input. And I try to move the slide again. Here we go, Katja. Thank you very much, Claudia, also for the introduction. Um, this is going to be, again, a very quick um, journey through the chapter uh, because we hope, obviously, that you all read the report and want to give a bit more space for questions and discussion. Um, in the chapter itself, my co-author and co jo colleague John Lee and I uh, look at how the Chinese leadership has uh, built digital infrastructure and has worked on its capabilities uh, to foster but also to use information and communication technologies um, in reaching its goals. And uh, what stands out really is that um, the government does see digitalization as key to achieving China's domestic um, development goals. So you see that, for example, in economic development for um, digital technologies are seen as, as fundamental to um, achieve China's industrial upgrading, uh, to implement and drive forward economic growth, um, but also to foster and fuel domestic consumption. Um, everybody is very familiar with the Chinese e-commerce environment and um, now the myriad of policies uh, regulating that area, but also um, the large investment funds um, that were set up to, um, again, uh, continue to um, catapult growth in the sector. Um, you also see this focus on, on digitization as um, an important instrument and driver for governance, um, especially in the area of, of resource allocation, of monitoring what is done in China, um, also by, by its officials, um, as my colleague Nis Grunberg and Mac have um, have touched upon before, um, this is seen as a way to also overcome the distances within China and the distance from the center um, to local governance and really try and better monitor what they're doing. Um, this is reflected also in the in the buzzword and the policy buzzword of monitoring based governance um, in terms of keeping both uh, public but also private sector actors um, under watch and um, and uh, a bit tighter control than especially uh, in the past administrations. Um, but it, digitization and new platforms are also really used and leveraged in terms of providing better access to public services. Um, a number of, um, of government services can now be applied for or um, essentially conducted online um, to an extent that, at least for us Germans, is often quite astonishing. Um, I had to really um, kind of take a step up from, I guess, the digital opportunities I had in China when moving back to Germany. So um, this is also something to keep in mind, especially when looking at the debates um, about the darker sides of China's use of technologies, especially um, where it is used to control online content, um, the large censorship system that has been built up to both track, uh, monitor, but also censor information um, at, at what is now lightning speed, especially if you look at um, kind of outbreaks of online discussions and protests over the past year. Um, you do see that also in the in the large buildup of um, surveillance capabilities, uh, especially at, at the local level, just the amount of, um, of, of cameras, of other daily monitoring tools that has been implemented and where the government is quite actively um, trying to build 
an ecosystem of sorts of digital platforms and really bring information together from different sources um, to have a better picture of what its citizens are doing. So it's, it's really a very two-pronged approach of uh, one, providing better, more efficient um, services and, and opportunities for growth, but also really leveraging these technologies um, for control and um, social control to guard one of the most important um, overarching priorities of the system that uh, my colleague Helena will also talk about, uh, which is national security and regime security. Um, in terms of security, obviously, um, technological self-reliance is also a key um, item on the agenda. And I would briefly just pass directly to my colleague and co-author John um, to elaborate a bit more on his points in the report. Um, John, if you're here with us. Thanks very much, Katya. Just waiting until we have the image on screen. Perhaps in the interim, um, I might just share a few highlights before I pass to the SMO, Mr. Cremens, regarding my section of the chapter. So I think it's important to put this into the context of a longer term priority on so-called informatization on the part of the Chinese leadership. And that is, of course, the application of ICT, of information and communications technology throughout society, which the CCP identified some time ago as the essential prerequisite for China's progress. It's a world historical trend in which China must compete with the global technological leaders in order to reach the international position of leadership that it desires and to achieve its own development goals. That said, China is coming from a long way behind. And I think this needs to be kept in, to, in perspective, particularly with um, much hyperbole in media commentary these days about Chinese technological prowess. Certainly, Xi Jinping himself has called vulnerability in core technologies China's greatest hidden danger. That, of course, has been highlighted by US export control measures against Huawei, SMIC, and other key Chinese technology companies in the recent past. Um, and in that context, the goal at present is not technological order key because they know they cannot achieve that, but rather increase self-reliance um, with aspirations to leadership over the longer term. And that, of course, is part of the story of turning China into a technological cyber superpower. But that is a much longer term project out to mid-century. Um, right now, the implication is that China still needs the outside world and will continue seeking connections with the outside world, as has been made clear in the statements um, from Xi Jinping downwards. You can look at what's in the 14 to five year plan, for example, and a bunch of other signals that the system recognizes the degree of dependence that Chinese industry and the research sector still has on foreign expertise, key technological inputs. The difference from the past, of course, is that China will be increasingly seeking to negotiate its engagement with the outside world on its own terms. But um, this creates obviously a set of opportunities as well as risks from the viewpoint of foreign stakeholders engaging with China over the next few decades within the persistent framework of the CCP's larger political goals. So I will wrap it up there, happy to go into any of those points in more detail in the question and answer. And at this point, pass to Mr. Roger Cremens. Thank you for that, uh, John. And uh, as always, it's a beautiful tragedy that I'm faced with uh, in having to comment to a very rich paper and a very rich presentation uh, in a very short time. Uh, there's just so much in there. Um, what I'd like to, on the basis of this presentation, is think a little bit through some of the bigger questions uh, that I believe this presents, particularly given the fact that usually when we talk about technology, the technology is a proxy for talking about something else. We, we can talk about technology as a proxy for the competitiveness of the Chinese economy, for the capability of a uh, Chinese uh, state uh, in various fields, ranging from uh, long distance healthcare and education to surveillance and internal oversight, um, but also, for instance, technology as a proxy for uh, one of the big concerns that we have these days, and that is China increasingly setting the norms 
uh, not just for technology within its own realm, um, but uh, or, or within its own territory, uh, but worldwide as well, where very often, you know, we have discussions about standards. And believe you me, there are very few uh, topics as boring, as dry and unsexy as technological standards until you sort of can throw over this source of standards being this sort of magical key that unlocks control over the entire digital sphere uh, and that China is very much uh, in the process of trying to wrest uh, that key from us. Um, and obviously that's, that's a story that very often is told and that's also one of the reasons that I was so happy that uh, in this particular paper, um, you do point at the fact that we, you know, um, that it's the story is a little bit more complicated than that. From a political perspective, surveillance is obviously very important and it is central to uh, a particular part of the Chinese administrative logic, but it's not the only thing that the Chinese government does. And we need to take that broader view also to get a more correct understanding of uh, what I think is a, a, a fairly correct uh, self-assessment uh, from the Chinese leadership that while China may attain to a certain amount of global technological leadership, uh, certainly it is not going to reproduce um, the entire ecosystem, the, the entire digital ecosystem that we have uh, at home in one go. And certainly uh, John hasn't mentioned uh, his work on semiconductors in his presentation, but, but that is very much a poster child example of the non-obviousness or certainly the, the enormous challenges uh, for China to achieve uh, full autarky. That, that simply isn't going to happen. It's also not going to happen for a very simple other reason, which is that China would want to grow its exports uh, in the technological field, particularly those exports that carry indigenous standards and intellectual property rights. And this is one thing that we also really have to think about long and hard. You know, very often we talk about Belt Road or, or China's um, growth, uh, growing international footprint where it comes to digital standards as um, a manifestation of a uh, will to power, a will to global power by Xi Jinping, um, a lot of this is at least as much, if not more, simply about money. It's about China moving away from a model where it builds iPhones for the rest of the world. And of the 700 euros that the iPhone costs, about 20 to 25 euros stays in China to a, a model where much more of that added value is captured into uh, into China in order to achieve one of the ultimate end goals, which is uh, parity in wealth uh, with the West, um, which obviously we cannot fault them for that. And the last thing uh, that uh, I would like to bring into this discussion, again, when we talk about, uh, you know, China potentially spreading its model, is the whole idea of the internationalization of the Chinese system, where uh, I am more and more convinced that Europe and the United States will converge more with certain aspects of uh, China's view on cyberspace in the future. And the reason for that is um, perhaps a little bit uh, counterinstinctive, um, but I think uh, certainly understandable. And that is that uh, as a technological latecomer, China has thought long and hard about what technology would mean in its society. Whereas the techno-optimism that uh, we have very much enjoyed in the 1990s and 2000s very often precluded us from asking uh, the very tough questions about the impact of technological choices on our politics, economics, and society. With the result that uh, on quite a few points, it turns out that uh, the Chinese approach um, contains a grain of uh, log of, 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 of being logical um, and indeed in some cases being fairly well thought out or at least China being the first to get there. And the big example of that is perhaps the data security law which came out this week and that is the first piece of legislation in any major cyber power worldwide which directly addresses the question how do we deal with data, personal data or otherwise, that 
is national security relevant. No other major uh, cyber power in the world has a similar piece of legislation. In Europe, obviously, we've done a lot on personal data protection. And um, obviously, governments also have uh, systems of classification for national security relevant government information. But China is really the first government that has looked at data in general and said, you know, there's a whole lot of data that could be national security relevant or relevant to the public interest, and we're going to protect it. And whether those solutions are desirable, it's not up to me to say, uh, partially because it's all very speculative. We've had the law for a couple of days, that's it. Um, but certainly with respect to third countries, China is the only game in town where it comes to answering these questions. And so um, I believe that's also something that very much deserves looking at. And with this, I'll leave it to Claudia for the Q&A. Thank you, and thank you for your invitation. Thank you very, very much, Rochier. Um, and um, picking up your point on the data security law, um, maybe it, it's just my the, the question I had jotted down here. Um, it has really caused quite a few discussions in China and abroad. And my question would be, I mean, the law will stipulate how data is used, collected, protected and developed in China. So it, it will potentially affect a broad range of industries, including tech, telecommunications, transportation, finance, health, um, in China and abroad. Um, so how will this law affect China's digitalization efforts and also its relations to foreign companies who also are affected by it? They, I, I don't know, they have to, will have to um, obey to this law when it comes to their data in China. Obviously. Uh, and, and, and I think where it comes to technology, we're coming at a very interesting point in time. And if you will allow me a metaphor, I would like to compare this point in time with uh, uh, the idea of unsafe at all costs, the very controversial study of the American car industry uh, that was issued in the 1960s and that really led to progress in car safety. And so pretty much what we've had a, over over the last 20 years is largely unfettered growth in the digital economy, characterized by very light touch regulation, both at national levels and in terms of international governance. Um, and that has meant that uh, tech businesses, Chinese and international tech businesses, were able to develop rapidly um, without a very great need to devote resources to security, be it the technical security of, 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 of you know, their, their databases, but also this very sort of broad question of, is what we do conducive to, greater, to the greater health of our political, economic, and social systems? And again, that is true in China in as much uh, as it is here, albeit obviously uh, within different circumstances and different constraints. What we are seeing now is uh, everywhere in the world, including in China, a greater realization of the costs, risk, and harms associated uh, with wholesale digitization. And we are now at the point in time where regulation is coming in everywhere in the world, where we're doing to tech companies essentially what regulators told car manufacturers when they said, look, it's going to cost you money, but you're going to have to invest in crash tests, seat belts, airbags, predictive, um, uh, predictive anti-collision systems, and so forth. We're also seeing an environment in which national security is becoming much more important. There is no pure economic logic for the dispersion of the semiconductor industry, which we now see several governments, including Washington and the European Union, proposing. However, we're going from a logic that is purely economic driven to a, multi, to a much more multi-factor logic where not just economic uh, incentives or uh, economic imperatives uh, have a deciding role anymore. And, and so this is the paradigmatic shift where we are telling technology companies to install the proverbial, to invest in seat belts, crumple zones, airbags, and all that. Uh, and that is going to be a condition for them to be in the business. Uh, and obviously China is going a little bit further than that in the field of national security right now, but I fully expect that uh, other governments are going to go this way into the near future. One could see this, you know, the technology industry has for the last 20 years 
pretty much defied the normal economic laws of gravity, what we're seeing now is normalization. The digital sector is going to be treated like any other business when it comes to regulation. Thank you, Rohi. Um, Katja, if I may challenge you, what do you think are the implications of this law for foreign businesses? It's still very new, but maybe you have a first take on that. Uh, you need to switch on your mic. <laughs> Um, actually, for this question, I would refer to John, um, my colleague, who's much more familiar with the topic than I am, um, for an answer. Okay, John, if you would like to come in here, be my guest. Yes, certainly, Claudia. Could you just recap the main points, please? Um, the question was referring to what the um, data, sec national, data security law means for foreign business in China. Well, I think it's important to recognize that foreign businesses have faced uncertainties regarding their operation in China's data space for some time now. I mean, just for example, the cybersecurity law has been enforced for several years with quite opaque data localization requirements in terms of the sort of assessments that need to be performed before you can transfer data generated within China outside of China, what kind of data is covered, who performs the security assessments. So if anything, um, in some ways, the extension of regulation may help foreign actors in terms of providing more clarity. Now, obviously, one of the main caveats to that is that inevitably these laws, um, the enacted and the draft ones, all contain quite wide exemptions for national security. And um, as has been pointed out um, frequently in our work at Merix, um, although China may be extending protections um, for people's personal data, whether it's that of Chinese citizens or foreigners um, within Chinese cyberspace, those are more effective via the non-state actors than they are via via the Chinese government itself. So I think um, we should probably not get bogged too much down in the weeds of the provisions of the data security law for this forum, but keep focused on the fact that um, the environment is becoming more difficult in general. The political climate for European firms um, and indeed all foreign firms operating in China is becoming much more politicized from both ends, it must be said. Obviously, um, the outcomes from the G7 over the weekend, I imagine that we'll talk on, we'll touch on later in the discussion today. But um, in a context of at least partial decoupling or patchwork decoupling, as a joint report um, with the European Chamber of Commerce in China at the start of this year described it, um, there are all kinds of obstacles um, and problems for foreign firms seeking to operate um, in increasingly digitized economic systems across China's border. Um, perhaps it might be just worth flagging, though, that um, again, further to something that I said in my remarks before, the Chinese government is trying to square the circle, if you like, or to have its cake and eat it too, um, in terms of being connected to the outside world, even as they try and assert more and more control over cyberspace within China. And so, for example, they do have pilot projects in place across the country in a number of cities um, which are designated as basically um, development zones for advanced service industries um, where new or bespoke data governance rules will apply. Um, and the idea there is basically to facilitate cross border data transfers in the same way as special economic zones were used back in the 1980s in a physical manufacturing goods context um, to quarantine if you like, um, the exchanges with the outside world until it's more obvious to the CCP how that is going to transform Chinese society more generally. So it's a very mixed picture. Um, it bears watching. Um, unfortunately, there is also the final context um, which we referred to, of course, in our last China briefing at Merrick's um, of an increasing resort to retaliatory measures for measures by foreign governments that are perceived to target or discriminate against China's interests. Um, and the data security law includes such provisions, but they are also evident um, in a bunch of other Chinese laws concerning foreign investment and um, most recently uh, the counter sanctions law, for example. Thank you, John. We will definitely, uh, yes, Rohi, you want to chip in here. Um, yes, session definitely. will soon be over, but I'll give you this minute. <laughs> No, uh, so just a two-finger remark on uh, John's uh, sort of uh, point on the data security law. It's also uh, what Chinese laws like this tend to do is they tend to create a framework. So the provisions themselves are fairly vague. It says, you know, we will have a system for the classification of data. Um, and so what is really going to happen is the law shifts a lot of power to specific industry regulators. So what applies in one section of the economy governed by one ministry may, in terms of information classification, there will be catalogs and mechanisms that come out, will, uh, will be very different in other uh, parts. So this is really where 
there's going to be a whole bunch of consultants and translators uh, making a lot of money on specific industries. Thank you, Rochier. Um, one last question to Katya, and you have like half a minute to answer it. Um, you, you also pointed out that there are that Chinese digitalization goes very smoothly, and they have made progress in fields where Western countries cannot have not catched up yet. Um, what do you think about cooperation with Chinese companies in this realm, especially when it comes to research and development? And keep it brief, we're moving on. I'll do my best. Um, um, I think uh, the, this provides me with a good opportunity to pick up um, a point that Aurier made before, that um, technology is, is not in itself, um, it, it's not neutral in that sense, but it really, um, especially in the Chinese context, is closely related to the area in which, is, in which technologies are used. So for example, um, when it comes to uh, use of technologies in um, environmental protection and improving, um, for example, um, traffic uh, management, resource allocation, there's definitely um, still much room for collaboration. But uh, the kind of the spectrum between um, technologies or um, databases and applications used for social monitoring and control and uh, the more positive aspects obviously um, is the main question, uh, especially for international companies and, and um, policy stakeholders that want to collaborate with their Chinese counterparts um, because this is where you do find really um, fundamental ethical risk also in terms of um, in, in terms of uh, normative diffusion and, and standard setting globally, um, for example, uh, and especially in the area of surveillance, um, which is, um, as we also, I think, mentioned in the report, very much um, connected to uh, very nice and positive sounding buzzwords of um, smart cities, of um, modern governance and of um, technology aided governance. Thank you, Katja, um, and sorry for uh, having you keep this so brief. Um, to everyone who is interested in learning more about this very, the many facets of digitalization in China, please, I, I can only refer you to our chapter and, of course, to Rochier's impressive work. Um, we are now going to move on to the third session, and I will again try to move my slides here. Um, our speaker is Helena Legada. Um, I already introduced her. She coordinates international relations research at Merix and focuses on China's foreign defense and security politics, um, including their domestic sources and drivers and their geopolitical impact. And we have Wolfgang Niedermark joining us as a commentator today. Wolfgang is a member of the executive board of the Federation of the German Industry. Um, the acronym is BDI, all Germans know it. Um, he has worked, uh, among others, for uh, the German chemical BASF and spent many years in Hong Kong. And he will later comment on Helena's input. But now, Helena, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Claudia. Can you hear me okay? Very well, thanks. Perfect. Uh, since this is, as Claudia mentioned, the very packed event, I'm going to try to keep this very brief and just make a couple of main points from, from my chapter in this Merrick's paper on China. This chapter focuses on the securitization of China's international behavior. And what it aims to do is to try to explain some of the reasons behind China's more assertive, even aggressive, you could say, foreign policy approach and tone that we've seen in the past couple of years. Uh, we can think about anything from uh, the Chinese government's reactions to the debate about Huawei and its inclusion in, in 5G networks in Europe, or to any sort of criticism um, of the crackdown in Xinjiang, for example, more recently. Uh, this chapter posits that the underlying this new approach to foreign policy fundamentally is the party's new and expanded concept of national security, which is something that's, that's come up repeatedly in the, in the last two sessions. Um, the concept of national security in China today um, was framed by Xi Jinping back in 2012 as comprehensive national security, quote unquote. Uh, the ultimate goal of this chapter is to protect the stability and survival of the regime. Uh, this is an expanded concept that moves beyond a traditional view of national security as we have it uh, here in Europe or in, or in the United States to effectively subsume all other elements of policymaking, including China's development goals. Um, what the party has done is it's set up a centralized and unified national security system built around this concept that aims to link and coordinate 
national security work across all policy fields. As you can see on the graphic in this slide, the current concept includes 16 types of security uh, that go from more traditional areas like military security or territorial security to issues like the security of overseas, China's overseas interests or cultural security. So it's an incredibly broad concept. So when China talks national security, um, they don't mean exactly what we think when we discuss national security. The bottom line is that everything has become a matter of national security for the party, or at least it can be framed as a matter of national security for the party. Another important element of this system is that it is designed to tackle both internal and external threats to the regime and to the political system, which is something that the party sees as in incredibly urgent right now, given what Xi Jinping has uh, termed the increasingly challenging international environment that China is living in. Uh, given the situation in the international stage, increasing geopolitical competition with the United States and the West more broadly, the party has assessed that the passive defense of China's traditional national security, so inside China's borders, is no longer enough. In order to guarantee the survival of the regime in the long term, the party has to move towards proactively shaping the international environment. This has become effectively a matter of self-defense for the party. Um, the consequences have been quick to materialize, and I, I go into, of course, a lot more detail in my chapter, but just to mention a couple of elements, what we're seeing is a blurring of lines between China's domestic and international red lines and behavior. Um, some of what was in the past reserved for domestic sensitive issues, um, Tibet, Xinjiang, um, Hong Kong, etc. Some of those behaviors and reactions are now bleeding into the international stage and becoming a lot more common on a range of other policy issues. So what does this mean more concretely? It means that we're seeing a China a Chinese government that is more willing to take forceful and preemptive action against any perceived threats to its national security. Again, keeping in mind that almost everything can be a matter of national security if the party wants to frame it that way. And this, of course, includes issues related to just criticism or research. They can easily be framed as, as national security. Another element is a strong push towards increasing the extraterritorial application of Chinese laws. We saw the inclusion of extraterritorial clauses, for example, in the Hong Kong national security law, um, but they keep coming up. The most recent anti-foreign sanctions law, for example, also contains some extraterritorial clauses. And thirdly, another element of this new approach is attempts by the party, by the Chinese leadership, to effectively police behavior overseas and inform formerly domestic red lines also overseas. Um, this new approach will have a clear impact on all foreign actors from governments to companies to individuals. Um, and I'm sure uh, my commentator, uh, Mr. Wolfgang Niedermach, will, will be able to go into a bit more detail into those. And I'll just finish up by saying that this approach is, of course, triggering a lot of backlash, uh, not just in the United States, but also in Europe and, and elsewhere in the world. Despite that, I would argue that this approach is here to stay until the party feels safe enough in the international arena and until the party stops seeing developments abroad as threats to its national security and therefore its survival, it is unlikely to change how it approaches its international relations. This new system is too closely linked to the party's legitimacy and survival. Um, thank you. And with that, I'll pass it over to Volvang. Yeah, thank you, Helena. And um, thank you to Miko Rotari and Nice Grünberg uh, for inviting me here to um, comment on this excellent report. Um, for us as BDI, as a business community, it's absolutely crucial to learn more about what's going on in China. We need your papers um, and the work that you and your colleagues are doing in uh, Merix is absolutely crucial for us and highly appreciated. And uh, I, I really want to stress it also for political reasons, you know, the background. Um, by the way, some people in the audience might uh, wonder 
why you invited the only business representative here in a round of excellent academics and uh, think tanker fellows, uh, think tank fellows, um, to comment on um, the security issue rather than the economical. Um, as Hitler pointed out, we see the mixing of politics and economics and um, that is uh, a fact we cannot escape and that is a defining feature of Xi Jinping's concept of comprehensive national security and um, that has its effect uh, on uh, us and, and far beyond the Chinese borders. And um, with this, uh, we witness a politicization and a secu securitization process of uh, Chinese policy, which is uh, affecting the companies sharply. And um, you have said uh, many things about the G7 and even the NATO summit uh, this week. And uh, that is proof um, that this uh, mixing of the realms is ongoing and highly relevant. And um, we have discussed various realms already. Um, first, the sensitive political issues like uh, Xinjiang or Hong Kong. I don't want to repeat that, but uh, of course it brings companies into a position that they have to choose between um, legal obligations in China and at home. And now at home, we have a, a new German, uh, uh, yeah, it's called a uh, due diligence law and uh, we will have a European one uh, next year, uh, most probably. And, um, and then the companies are in a dilemma. Uh, where should they comply with all these legal requirements, more in China or at home? And the same is true, of course, for all these, what has been said on data and data security, cyber security law same problem here and um, for multinational companies that might only uh, only uh, occur that there are some costs related and some trouble but for SMEs it might be the case that they have to choose where to put their capacities on and um, and the same is true for export controls and sanctions another realm where we see uh, companies are torn between the two poles uh, which are established and um, that they have to um, abide to all these rules coming up in China and then uh, have to decide whether they follow uh, political or security correctness in China and then uh, perhaps may offend uh, some legal compliance at home. So um, that is really um, causing inconvenient trouble for all those companies who have been sure that everything will be all right in a uh, positive development of positive globalization, easygoing with a multilateral rule-based order. And now we have to see that it's not working. And then um, this um, ugly word of decoupling came up. And people say, yeah, let's simply decouple uh, if the threat is that big. And uh, of course, we belong to those people who say, no, decoupling is definitely not what we want. But it's not that simple that um, we, we simply go on as we did before in recent years. So uh, we have to find a new balance and we have to uh, find a way where we can continue our close corporations, although we find all these uh, problematic uh, situations. And um, as BDI, we are thinking a lot about the concept, by the way, not only for China, how to deal with it, uh, but uh, with autocratic systems in general. Of course, China is the biggest dragon in the room, but uh, there are more other companies where we have similar issues with Russia, with Turkey, with Saudi Arabia, and I don't want to mentioned too many, but the list is relatively long. And um, we believe that we need a new balance approach where it is still uh, possible to cooperate and to do business in China and elsewhere, and to compete in China, in, in their markets, in third markets, and still uh, go um, in certain situations in uh, confrontation. And we frame this as responsible coexistence. So responsible coexistence, what does it mean? It does not mean we shouldn't push back. Yeah, it's not giving up, but 
on the contrary, we believe that we need to confront China on many issues. I mentioned some of them. The point is that China and its system will not go away. And it's globally interconnected in this world. And we need to find a way to coexist and to cooperate still. And um, finding this right approach will involve a lot of, as I said, inconvenient uh, problems and questions. And now the hard time begins. Where exactly are our red lines when it comes to standing up for our values? What is a red line for a certain country, for a government or for an individual company? Um, and, and companies uh, have to answer the question, how much economic dependence is healthy? Is it helpful or is it counterproductive? Uh, which sectors of economic interaction with China are critical in terms of our own national security? And of course, we also see our own national security as a precondition for all kind of political goals. Uh, we even here at BDI, we have a saying that security is the mother of all sustainability. So we don't have the answers yet. Um, it's too simple to simply decouple. Um, it's also too simple to uh, continue with an uncritical engagement. We have to find a balance and we try to find this balance under this uh, term of uh, responsible coexistence. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang, for this apt description on the predicament that businesses find themselves in right now, especially after the anti-sanctions law was passed really uh, within the blink of an eye, <laughs> very quickly and unexpected for many. Um, you just mentioned red lines. Um, could you maybe elaborate on what this would be? I mean, just from your point of view, I guess that different business sectors have different um, notions of this. But what would the red line be for you when it comes different, to making different business sectors in China? This might be affected in a different um, manner or in different dimensions. But um, of course, there are some clear red lines. What's going on in Xinjiang? And I think we have enough proof for what is going on is so problematic that we have to stand up and to raise our voice. And we did it uh, also as a business association. And uh, of course, we, uh, we agree to what political decisions, uh, to, to the politi political decisions that have been taken. And um, there is a red line which is crossed. And, and, and then you have to ask yourself, can I comply with my own standards, my own code of, co code of conduct? And um, is, is there a certain uh, threshold uh, where I have to ask myself whether I can continue doing business there? Um, it's, it's not our role to define that. Um, there is a political definition and there was a clear statement and there were sanctions and yes, uh, we have a certain understanding for that and um, there is a mechanism for these sanctions and we have to accept it and we yeah we can understand this decision on the other hand what does it mean for the company now is a question that companies uh, have to answer and um, i'm i'm happy that our friends from the german chamber have started a process where they offer uh, a new code of conduct also for all these companies in china not only in, in the, in the um, Western provinces. Uh, what does it mean for me here in my personal um, and or my company's uh, yeah, value framing? Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, I, I would like to uh, know, learn more about this term of responsible coexistence. But since I know that Helena has to leave us in a couple of minutes, Helena, let me take the liberty and ask you one last question. Um, we have just heard a lot of pretty hard tones coming out of the G7 summit and NATO, um, all summit leaders um, recognizing the need to respond to a um, more um, assertive China on all different levels. Um, what would your take be? Is this sufficiently strong to deal with this China who, who takes security first as a paradigm in all sectors? Um, thanks, Claudia. That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think the first thing to, to say about the G7 is that we're still a bit short on the details. So reading the, the communique, there, there are a lot of signals um, that there's 
agreement across all of the members and the guest countries, Australia, India, South Korea, and South Africa, that there is a need to confront China on a number of issues. And those range from um, the, the sort of China's impact on the rules-based international system to non-market policies to Taiwan and the free and open Indo-Pacific. So it's, it's a really wide range of issues. So we now need to get from there to an agreement on what sort of action we are going to take. And that is, uh, to a certain extent, still missing. Um, there, there are some signals that there, there is going to be a new framework to potentially compete with China's Belt and Road Initiative, this new infrastructure partnership. But let's see whether that materializes. For now, I think what we're seeing is just mostly an acknowledgement uh, by all countries involved that China's new approach and, and China's global ambitions um, do have an impact on the rules-based international order and do have an impact on the G7's and NATO's interests. And that something has to be done about it. Um, so we'll, we'll have to watch that space. And I talked a lot about the G7. It's a bit similar with, with NATO. Again, the, the communique recognizes China's growing influence and, and policies and their impact. But now the process starts to develop a new strategic concept for the alliance that is due to be approved next year. It is in that strategic concept, in theory, where we're going to see um, the alliance address some of these challenges and, and possibly, ideally, come up with some more concrete action. Uh, but my take for now is that this is just um, sort of signaling that they, they acknowledge and they recognize the problems and they are willing to do something about it. And what I would note is that the response that we're getting from China is very much that the Chinese leadership is seeing these communiques and, and these kind of attempts at confronting China's behavior internationally as threats to its national security. And we're, we're seeing some fairly sort of furious um, statements come out of coming out of Beijing um, already. Um, and I'll just finish off um, noting that um, after the G7 foreign ministers meeting back in May, Beijing actually accused the, the G7 of wrongly stretching the national security concept to uh, attack China and, and contain China's rights, which I, which I thought was a, a pretty ironic statement to make, given the fact that Beijing is doing precisely that. Thank you, Helena. Um, and I think every end. This is the end of the third session, and it's the start of the final session. And Wolfgang, I will not let you go without explaining what responsible coexistence is, but let's move to the last part um, and Helena you feel free to leave us whenever you need to um, for the last part this is our final dis discussion I would I would like to bring Miko back on stage together with our commentators um, and we will try to pick up a few more questions from the audience but also I have one bigger questions for all of you and you can answer it from your specific point of view. So Wolfgang speaking as a representative of business, Rochier as a digitalization expert, um, Mac as a state capitalism expert, a, a term that she, uh, so, to so Nis told me, coined herself with other colleagues. Um, and Miko, of course, as the director of Merix, who was part of this paper um, and also contributed a chapter um, dealing with the, well, with the impact and um, effect the CCP's assertive strategies have on Europe and international actors. So we just, um, Helena just answered my question on what came out of the G7 and NATO summit. We did see a sea change compared to what happened in these formats when Donald Trump was still in charge as a US president. Um, so there are changes ahead, but not much detail is known. So I can just take the liberty and ask Miko what he would say, how Western democracies would need to deal with this China that is ruled by a CCP in struggle mode, as we put it in our paper, as it moves into the next century. And Miko, I don't know if you're there because I can't see you on my screen, but I hope you are. <laughs> yes, I am. Thank you, Claudia. And um, I would like to use your opportunity to thank everyone on this panel really for taking your time and your contributions. Um, quickly, I, I think... Um, First of all, we need to recognize um, the trajectory of politics and business in China. And um, we also need to recognize that China 
and the leadership is on a trajectory and a path towards the 20s party congress and that means that um, politics are getting more tight in the next one or two years. Um, this will have an impact on international um, exchanges. Um, it's certainly not appeared uh, in the history of the CCP where we will see a relaxation and greater openness and more exchanges, etc. because it's a politically precarious time. Um, so that's the first, uh, I think we just have to accept that and be prepared for that tightening of politics um, in China. Now, the second point that I wanted to make is that um, we have to recognize that the Chinese leadership is building what they probably would consider an anti-fragile system, i.e. they are trying to work towards a system that is not just adaptive and resilient, but is really robust in preparing itself for uncertainty. And um, so when business and other actors are seeing China growing and coming first out of the crisis and um, 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 looking at the opportunities that this creates, I think that's an absolutely fair assessment, but there's a second reality to that, and that's um, of the leadership looking at a confluence of crisis really um, coming together in the next two or three years. Uh, and that's the old issue really um, that many have been discussing. It's, it's lack of productivity, it's the financial system vulnerabilities, it's demographic impact on, on growth opportunities, it's growth really slowing down international pressure and dependence on international sources. And all of that, I think um, uh, the leadership in Beijing is very well prepared um, to, to present itself as still a leading force and a, a, a really robust entity in such a difficult environment. Um, so they are preparing um, for greater risks and um, for the need to actually um, shape international relations more proactively, preemptively, as Helena has put it. And I think we should be prepared as well. Um, it's certainly not a time in a period where um, we, we should um, have the wrong balance in our assessment of the global environment and um, China's leadership is making the right bet in that regard. Uh, thank you, Miku. And thanks for pointing out again this point that Mac already mentioned in the beginning, that China may seem very strong and stable to all of us, but um, that the regime itself uh, maybe has a different point of view because they also see the fragile and weak parts they want to fight. Um, um, Max said the government is paranoid, and I really liked <laughs> that kind of phrasing. Um, Wolfgang, may I turn back to you? Um, so business or the BDI has developed certain ideas on how to deal with this um, uh, outwardly strong, but uh, looking inward, maybe a bit fragile government. Um, and what exactly do you mean by um, responsible coexistence with such an authoritarian state that really tries to play out its strengths internationally and also vis-a-vis -vis businesses? Yeah, in a way, um, we mean that these times where we think uh, that uh, change is triggered by trade, you know, this famous wording uh, in German, Wandel uh, durch Handel, for the time being, doesn't work. Um, and it would be naive to still stick on this um, concept um, I, I would say, of course, um, trade um, is a good thing, a good element in order to create uh, mutual dependencies and then uh, trigger some uh, change, but not to an extent that we have a political development towards pluralistic or even democratic system in China or elsewhere. So we have to accept that China there, yes, I see the point that not uh, everything is, is uh, only uh, strong and, and safe in China. There are a lot of question marks and you have pointed out. But um, China uh, will not go away as a global power and a global impact on everything we do. And uh, by the way, it is in many uh, segments the biggest market we have and in many cases the only market which is growing. So we are, uh, of course, interested um, to cooperate with China. Um, in, in a way that we profit and China's uh, development uh, also when it comes to environment protection and climate protection, uh, where it is very obvious that we want to cooperate with China. And uh, the new concept is, yes, we accept that China will not change to a system we would prefer, sharing some values. Um, they will be very, very different to, and, and, and we have to be very critical on especially human rights. I think it will be also tough in the long run to discuss with China on climate protection. I'm not that sure that this will be easy. 
Um, I have a lot of question marks in that uh, again. And your colleagues from SWP, um, they had a nice description of these, um, Miko said one to two years, I think it will take longer. Um, and and uh, Mr. Kevin Rudd from Australia said that is a whole decade uh, uh, which is dangerous. Uh, it will take some years. It is an intermediate uh, reign uh, where we have to find a new system of globalization. The old globalization is gone. We cannot repair it. Um, um, I don't think it will work uh, simply to reform uh, WTO that must, if, if you can uh, rescue WTO at all, uh, perhaps only the name will uh, will keep, but um, it will be a complete different system. We have to reinvent it. And um, that's the time which is now beginning. And um, coexistence means, yes, we accept it for the time being. We are not defensive. We speak out on deficits and uh, we go on confrontation where it's needed, but we still strive for cooperation because that is also very important for the stability of our own communities without um, international trade and um, international cooperation in innovation in resources. And, and we will not solve the bigger global uh, uh, problems. And so we can't escape from this concept. That is what we are thinking. Thank you, Wolfgang. That sounds like a really very challenging situation to navigate, but seeing that you guys are developing strategies um, that are pretty detailed, I can I assume that the question one, uh, one participant here answers in the chat um, is already answered, that um, German companies continue to be eager to invest in China and that staying out of China or cutting China off from uh, one's business um, endeavors is not an option here. That's true, it's not an option. Okay, let me move on to Rochier. Yeah. Um, in general. Roch <laughs> in general, yes. And that's, um, thanks, that's, um, of course, that's, uh, yeah. no need to dive into this, I guess. Um, uh, Rochier, let me um, ask you, so how do we deal with the CCP in struggle mode and the CCP that is so keen on digitalization and in some parts has leapfrogged us when it comes to developing technologies? Um, what is there to be prepared for and how do we respond? I think, our, I think part of our problem is that we've been responding a little bit too much in the sense that um, very often I find that our China policy is predicated on whatever China is doing. Inevitably, it will do something we don't like and then we respond to it. And I think for starters, very often what I find in the technological field is that businesses or government officials will ask me a question that tends to take the form, what do we do about this Chinese thing that we don't like? And my answer is always, well, where do we want to end up? Uh, what are our own policy objectives that we would like to achieve rather than just sort of um, respond to whatever comes, comes, comes out of China. And very often when you ask that question, uh, you know, you find that the answer is very often not forthcoming or, or very vague. Um, it is not up to us to micromanage China. It is not up to us to try to steer what's happening in Beijing. I think our, I think we have for a very long time overestimated our ability to get Beijing to change. Um, maybe I'm overly cynical, but I was always on the, uh, I was always one of these people who didn't quite believe that China would ever, you know, democratize in any recognizable way, certainly not within my lifetime. Um, but so we should micromanage China. Our ability to influence what's going on in Beijing is small and shrinking. And so what we really should be doing is, you know, what China has done, as, as I said in my, uh, in my previous remarks, and to really figure out what is the situation that we're facing here? What is the future that we want to work towards in something that works for us, something that is feasible, realistic and sustainable. And I very often find that when it comes down to what is feasible, realistic and sustainable, our own politicians and business leaders have been far too willing uh, to kick that can down the road. 
Um, what does that mean? Well, it means for us, most of all, the loss of a fantasy, i.e. the fantasy that we would somehow bring the light of freedom and democracy to China. If it will come, it will not be because we did it. Uh, and, and as I said, personally, I'm not convinced that uh, that is what, going, what is going to happen. Um, and obviously that's going to have consequences. I mean, uh, I am very sympathetic to the Dutch, uh, to, to the German uh, use of proverbs. In Dutch, we, uh, in Dutch, we have the metaphor of uh, the, the vicar and the merchant in describing Dutch foreign policy. And what we've tried to do with China is keep both the vicar and the merchant happy. And that is, particularly in the technological field, no longer going to be possible. Uh, particularly because um, we could only have the globalized digital economy that we had because China fulfilled a particular role in that digital economy, uh, for instance, as a locus for manufacturing, which it's no longer willing to play. And that means that we need to have very tough conversations about what do we expect in our own societies. Uh, and hopefully that's a point where we can have a conversation where we can actually create a way of living that does not mandate the impoverishment of millions of people halfway around the globe. Sorry, I, I know it's, it's a very broad answer, but I think that is, that is the core of it. We're no longer at a point where putting band-aids on a manifestly unsustainable mode of operation is going to help. Yeah. Thank you, Rochier. Um, anyone wants to chip in here on this very broad analysis? If not, um, uh, you would, can also I would cut like it. to comment. Because yes, I'm 20 it, years older, I guess it's always difficult to guess from the uh, small picture here, but I, I think I'm 20 years older than Roger. Um, 20 years ago, there were a lot of Chinese politicians uh, which made us believe that there is not a democratization, but an opening of and also a more open society in China is possible. That would not uh, lead to a parliamentarian democracy, but that's uh, anyway not our uh, uh, mandate to, to uh, strive for that. Um, but openness and certain uh, following the rules, uh, sticking to international trade rules and also to universal human rights. There were a lot of reasons to believe that China is developing in the right direction and that all changed with the core leader and the new emperor. And that is from 2012 onwards. I had my awakening process in Hong Kong in 2017, listening to his speech uh, of a new era when he told us that the times of humiliation are over and now uh, we are in a complete different world. And that w was when um, the last ones had to accept that this is perhaps, it, it was naive 20 years ago to believe that China is opening. And now we are uh, more and more people recognizing what's going on. So over with naivete and um figure out what your own po policy objectives are and do your homework. That would be my um, summary in a nutshell. Um, we are over time, but Mac, um, I would like you to come in for your take and maybe I can take it a little further. I have uh, one question here in the audience. Um, Alicia Garcia Herrero asking, is the CCP really that powerful and are the fears rational? Um, and that maybe also relates to a, a second question that will the CCP ever export its model, for instance, the, the model of merging economy and politics? Um, I appreciated this, this discussion and this exchange. I just want to emphasize this um, Wolfgang, Wolfgang's point about the contingency that really it's, you know, we tend to see everything as, oh, it was obvious that they were going to converge on this particular model of, you know, heavy state control. But in fact, there's been a lot of chance and contingency over time. Um, so are their fears rational? Um, you know, I think paranoia, it's a paranoid regime and it's kind of effective because it's paranoid. Um, and so it's been, par it's not, the paranoia isn't new, right? It's, it's been paranoid for a long time, really since Tiananmen, I would say, about the possibility of, you know, protests, dealing with protests and has developed, a, you know, a, a wide array of technologies from dealing with protests. 
but you know you can't really deny that in fact the the 2000s were a tenuous time for the regime in many ways i mean the riots in xinjiang and tibet um, really, really struck them in some ways. You know, what's happened in Hong Kong in the last few years, you know, from the perspective of the CCP was incredibly threatening to the CCP. But more importantly, when we think about, you know, the party's sense of its own internal discipline, the extent of corruption and the extent of elite networks um, really did scare the central um, kind of heart of the CCP that they had lost the discipline over party members. And, and so in that sense, it's not necessarily that their fears are irrational. I, I don't see anything looking like an Egypt in 2010 or something happening in China at all. And I've never seen some evidence of, of, of anything like that, right? But mass, you know, mass uprising is not the only source, you know, of, of authoritarian regime decay. You also have financial crises that lead to regime decay. And, 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 and certainly China has been really worried about those things. And so I wouldn't say it's totally irrational, nor is it totally rational. But, you know, like all kind of offensive paranoia, there's both something there and also a, a set of fears. It is not my belief that China is trying to export its model at all. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed reading um, the third paper and, and listening to the third panel. And I think Helena is, is, is exactly right that basically it wants a, it's a, wants a world that's safe for autocracy um, in, in another scholar's formation. And so it's really about its own system. Um, it's not pre prescribing a system for the rest of the world in, in any way that I see at all. I think it deeply believes that its system is best for China and we'll preserve that system for China, but I don't see any evidence that it's trying to export that way of doing things. It does want international legitimacy for what it does, right? So it doesn't want other, other countries to challenge its model um, from the outside and will resist that quite heavily, but it, it, but it doesn't want to see an Africa in which every, every country looks like China. And it realizes that most places do not have the history, do not have the state strength, do not have the um, population endowment, do not have the geography and the size to behave like China behaves. And so, um, so it's really more about making the world safe for China rather than making the world like China. But thank you. Thank you. And that's a great sentence to end this uh, really packed session, uh, packed with information. Um, we have reached the end, uh, dear audience members. And um, I would like to thank uh, again our guests here, Rocky Kramers, um, Meg Rithmeyer and Wolfgang um, Niedermark for being here with us today. Um, I have a feeling that you couldn't say everything that you wanted to say, but I hope that at least the most important points got across. At least for me, it was really very um, refreshing and insightful. Thank you for being here. And of course, thank you to all um, the contributors from my team, from Merix, Nis Grünberg, who did a great job in also bringing this panel together, Katja Drienhausen, John Lee for, her work, for their work on the digitalization chapter, Helena for her analysis of the securitization tendencies in China, and of course, Miko for his um, outlook chapter on what Europe and the world needs to do with this uh, CCP that's moving into its second century with a lot of nifty and clever strategies. Um, okay, that said, um, I can only once again point you to our paper. You find it on our website. Um, the link is shared here in the team and there's more upcoming. We have podcasts with our authors and a video with other experts uh, soon to be published on our website and on the regular video platforms. Um, we will keep you informed on our work. And um, with that, thanks again, everyone, for being here and have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you.